Hello and welcome back to coverage here at Grand Prix Los Angeles. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Paul Rietzel. And we're all set to go here in round number 10 where we have Andrew Beckstrom currently ranked 25th in the world. He's playing against Ed Wimpenny. And uh, we've got, well, these are two decks in that third category we talked about <laughs> yesterday, aren't they, Paul? We've got green, blue, stompy in the hands of Andrew Beckstrom. He said this was kind of his own thing uh, when we had an interview with him yesterday. And uh, he's got his own take on the format. Ed Wimpenny, though, on white, blue, or is perhaps the breakout deck of the format or of the tournament? I don't know. Uh, certainly um, a deck filled with cards that I had to look up, you know, because uh -huh. it, it's not a traditional archetype in the format. It's not something we've seen a ton of. Um, he's trying to put down, um, you know, a creature like Novice Knight or Adanto Vanguard or Knight of Grace that's difficult to interact with and then just build a battle cruiser with cartouches and Curious Obsession and things of that nature. Of course, one of the key cards in the deck right here is SRAM as well. This is... Uh, Basically a card advantage engine. Whenever you cast an aura equipment or vehicle, you draw a card. And all you have to do is put it on the stack, and you're getting that trigger. So this is kind of one of those things where Beckstrom is going to look over at SRAM here and say, well, if I don't have an answer for him, which he probably doesn't, he's going to have to race, right? He's going to have to pile on as much damage as he can as quickly as he can. The important card here for Ed in some of these race situations is Squire's Devotion. Squire's Devotion allowing him to get lifelink. And we know, we've know we noticed one of the weaknesses of these green decks is that they have a limited amount of ways to interact with their opponent's creatures. Um, SRAM is a card that, that mostly we've seen in combination decks in, in, uh, in modern where you try to play a bunch of zero casting cost things and maybe with a paradoxical outcome. Yep. Ed, a totally different take. He's using SRAM just kind of as a value engine to prevent himself from getting a um, two-for-one by, by uh, augmenting his creatures with auras. Beckstrom able to get that early plan rolling that I mentioned. He's going to play Ronus, crew up, and attack. So Ed's already down to 16. Nice hit there. But here we go. Watch Ed roll. Look at this. <laughs> Curious Obsession and a Cartouche of Knowledge. And remember, each of those drew him a card, plus an extra card, plus another extra card now. I mean, he's <laughs> really churning through his library with this one turn. He's going to be, you know, way ahead on cards, drawing tons of cards. He said ripping through his deck. Um, he really needs to find some way in order to um, turn the race in his favor. Because Andrew, as we mentioned yesterday, can make gigantic threats very, very quickly. Um, if you have power and toughness, is that the kind of thing you're interested in? Andrew can, can bring that to the table. Um, so again, Ed needs to find some way to gain life or be able to block what Andrew's doing. Yeah, this is actually probably going to come down to one type of big interaction where if Beckstrom can find a way to interact with SRAM or if Ed does find a lifelink enchantment and can hit just even one time, it could completely swing the game in one direction or the other depending on how it goes. Ed, kind of all in here on this SRAM right now. It's the only creature he's got on the battlefield. And, you know, that Curious Obsession really does encourage you to attack every turn with that, car, with that uh, creature that it's on in this case. And here we go. Bang, bang. Steel Leaf Champion says Ronus just woke up from his nap, and it's going to crew up the Heart of Kieran. So that's nine damage. And Ed, in one fell swoop, is down to seven. I wonder if that one hit with a... Squire's devotion is even good enough at this point. It might be, you know, he, but he certainly needs it. You know, the the, um, the possibility that he's going to be able to get into creature combat and have that be enough for unlikely. So I think that that all of his different uh, options start with Squire's devotion this turn. There it is. He's going to get a one-one life linker out of the deal as well. One one lifelinker importantly can can step in front of Ronus in a profitable way, so that's that's actually um, pretty relevant. Wow, Cartouche of Ambition there as well. Is that what that one is? Uh, solidarity. Thank think. you, yes. Solidarity. I knew it was wrong. I couldn't remember <laughs> what it was called, but still, like, what is he attacking for here? Two, three, four, five, six, six. Okay, with lifelink back up to thirteen, and uh, you know, realistically speaking, he should be able to kill Andrew next turn. And he's only looking at potentially 12, you know, Heshep Oasis on, on uh, um, the Steel League champion or, or the Heart of Kieran, so that's 5, 9, plus potentially another 3 is 12. Ed's at 13, so Ed actually looks like he has this um, lined up pretty well to me. Now, you mentioned Commit to Memory. Oh, commi <laughs> Commit or Walking Ballista are some of the cards that Andrew's looking here to kind of return the tide in his favor. Oh, God. Let's see if he has it. If he has untapped land, Commit. Send SRAM packing. I'll probably call this one a game. 
<laughs> but but short of that, I mean, more big power creatures is not going to cut it. He really needs uh, mm -hmm. um, when he starts having to do things like put Heart of Kieran in front of a SRAM on defense. That's not a path that, that to victory for him, given how many cards Ed is drawing. And God, I'd be so nervous if I was Ed having like. <laughs> Four auras on one SRAM, just, ugh, it's no way to live. You got to play one way, you know, you can, you can see. He's I'm not cut out for that life, <laughs> man. He doesn't look worried about it. No. Though. Ed's chill. Well, he's got two spell pierce and a dive down in his deck, so he really is not, <laughs> no, not a care in the world. And, of course, when your opponent's uh, got Heshep Oasis, a forest, and a, uh, a wastes in play, it's not so, uh, not so scary. Beckstrom is looking at this board like, what in the world am I supposed to do against this? Importantly, Andrew had to use his energy to cast that Steel Leaf champion. So even if he had, a, you know, fourth land and a commit, it would have to be Hinthrill and Harbor, uh, you know, or, or another copy of Ether Hub for him to be able to even cast commit. So He's going to cast the... Uh He's going to attack with a Steel Leaf Champion. It can't be blocked, but there was no fourth land there for Beckstrom, and he has commit in his hand, too. Oh. What a beating. And this is the nightmare we were talking about earlier. He's going to have to put Heart of Kieran into combat on defense. Just Oof. the chump block of SRAM. SRAM is still going to be able to gain all of that life from the uh, Squire's Devotion. So, But then it gets interesting. Like, can Beckstrom win after that? If he, he gets to untap with four mana this time thanks to Llanowar Elves. He's, he's going to need to find that blue mana. This is, this is the problem, I think, with a lot of the two-color mana bases in this format, yeah. is that if you don't find one of the dual lands, um, we've seen it with the red-black deck. If you don't draw Dragon Skull, Summit, or Canyon Slew, you just can't cast your black creatures, or your black spells, rather. Draw a couple of cards off a of Cartouche of Knowledge here. He's going to actually get that Vampire up in the air with the Cartouche of Knowledge. <laughs> Grip full of cards. He had to discard on his uh, his third turn because he just drew so many cards. So what a fun deck. I don't it still just makes me nervous, man. Oh, he tapped the wrong color of mana there, it looks like. Okay, yeah, it looks like he needed to tap the uh, Glacial Fortress instead of that island to cast Cartouche of Solidarity. Got it. So they had backed it up here. So they, they just quickly backed up because Ed didn't tap the, the right color of mana in order to play the white Cartouche. And so they just quickly backed that up, fixed it. In the situation, Ed is going to certainly attack with at least SRAM this turn. Be interesting to see what happens if he brings in the the flying creatures. Well, I can't quite see what that red is. That I probably just a vampire token off to the side there, or a first striking token. Maybe the first striking token from the first cartouche of solidarity. Yeah. Both of these players' decks are are, are little glass cannon types. You know that they they're not stock with uh, with interaction you know ed you know has really no way to deal with one of his opponent's creatures at all in, really? in his main deck um andrew we mentioned has walking ballista and commit but but certainly no way to actually do that yet um boy he's got arcane flight now on this thing there's no way he can make two lethal threats though with only one more mana left right highly doubtful but he is forcing andrew into a very uncomfortable block this turn it looks like a chump block as well as a huge chunk of life coming in from SRAM, still having a stocked hand and really being under no risk of dying from, from Ed's next turn. So even now, if Andrew is able to find blue mana to cast commit on SRAM, I think the damage might be done at this point. Yeah, because he because Ed has assembled himself two lethal threats now, right? Yes, he built two battle cruisers. Right. And and he's and since Andrew's taken a pretty big hit from the other one, what is it, four damage? Either one would be lethal next turn. Right. And Ed's gonna bolster his life total pretty significantly here thanks to that SRAM lifelink back up to 14. 
Vigilance and lifelink are not always the abilities we see be the most relevant and standard, but but here is a here is an actual match where the where the players are wanting to get into combat with each other. So, Andrew did take four though, right? Should yes, yeah, should have taken uh, four there. I think that vigilance creature got in. Although, well, I guess we won't need to find out. But uh, yeah, Ed Wimpenny. I mean, he did exactly what the deck's hoping to do, right? Turn two, SRAM, and then a bunch of cheap auras on it to make it into a battle cruiser and draw a bunch of cards and keep the, the land drops and the auras flowing, and that was it. And Andrew, importantly, doesn't have spectacular options in the post-sideboard game. So he has things like Thrashing Brontodon and Vivian Reed that can deal with auras and deal with enchantments, but that doesn't deal with the fact that, that Ed's designed his deck in such a way that all these auras are replacing themselves. So, um, so being able to deal with a one-off aura is not how you beat Ed's deck. You need to deal with the underlying threat, the creature itself. So, um, you know, cards like Unlicensed Disintegration and, and Commit, you know, that are kind of hard removal spells are, are what you're looking for to beat a deck like White Blue Auras. The green deck just doesn't have access to those kinds of things. So Andrew's best chance in, in these post-cyborg games is to stick an early Walking Ballista and then find a way to put counters on it with things like Verterous Gear Hulk. From Ed's perspective, his cyborg is is uh, is great. So four negate, um, you know, and then things like Thopter Rest that we're certainly going to see him be interested in. Probably Baffling End as well, which we see able to deal with a lot of Andrew's threats and give him a man advantage. Um, I like the one copy of Ether Tunnel. That's kind of an interesting sideboard card that I've not seen um, a ton of so far in uh, in Standard. Both these players mentioned the interview yesterday with Andrew. He said, you know what? I just wanted to play a deck that I enjoyed, that I was going to have fun yeah. playing, you know? And and, and um, look at both these players sitting at 8-1. Certainly the winner of this match is going to be on the fast track to a possible top 8 berth. I hope so. <laughs> yes. There, there, when you play these sorts of rogue strategies, you know, that there's, there is certainly a risk that you run into, you know, the uh, the boogeyman of the format, the red black type of deck, over and over again, and they get good draws, and then all of a sudden your your um, your slippers can shatter pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> so that's true. <laughs> it looks like players have uh, are just finishing up getting that sideboard in there. Beckstrom perhaps trying to go to some extreme lengths against this extreme strategy from N Ed Wimpenny. One of the advantages of, of bringing something like a white blue auras deck. That's not the kind of thing that Andrew in his preparation will have evaluated and analyzed a lot through Magic the Gathering online results or other previous tournaments. And you see him kind of raise his eyebrows here. You know, he's, he's not going to be confused about how to sideboard against Goblin Chain Whirler decks or Teferi decks. He mm -hmm. pretty much has a good idea of what's going on. Against Ed's deck, you know, he's not sure. Is, is Thrashing Brontodon even something that he wants right now? Is it worth right. it to kill a, a, a cartouche of knowledge? I mean, is that, is that a way to win? Do I want counter magic? Am I trying to stop him from... Ca so um, he's trying to think um, what makes sense. I'm on the play. Does it make sense for me to just put the blinders up and say, hey, I'm going to try to kill you on turn five? I think he's also just trying to count to 15. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, though. I, I like that he's being challenged sort of in real time here on, hey, let's throw a curveball at you while you're in the tournament right now where you don't get to go consult your pro tour testing team you know you know it's just it's on you andrew you have to figure out the best game plan right now from what you've seen in game number one from ed's deck yeah, that's pretty cool and this is why i i oftentimes will be uh skeptical when, when players are so reliant on things like sideboard guides or they ask for sideboard guides and articles because i think <laughs> that to a certain degree the the art and science of good sideboarding has been lost over time. We've gotten a little bit lazy. We're used to having kind of a notepad and just saying, okay, this comes in, this comes out. Archetypes are, are A, archetypes are not static. They're not an existing 75 cards. And B, sometimes people are completely throwing a um, kind of a, a wrench in the plans, you know, upsetting the apple cart. In that case, you need to have kind of the fundamentals of magic and understanding what sideboards are about and what some certain cards function is in post sideboard games in order to actually you know sideboard effectively did you see that i missed it <laughs> he uh he laid out his deck kind of pile shuffle style just to uh count count and then he kind of paused and he turned it over took one card out set it aside went back to the sideboard yep. <laughs> he's just like he had made that last card decision, mm -hmm. and he, I think, upon thinking about it, was like, no, no, I'm going to do it this way. I, this is what I was going to do. I'm going back to it. And now he's confidently shuffling here. 
but it shows you how close these decisions can be because he, like I say, he probably hasn't played this deck very often. So he's like, I got to make a move. And, you know, Ed's deck certainly looked quite good there. There's a lot of things that went wrong for Andrew pretty quickly in that game. He didn't have a copy of Turn 1 Land or Elves. Ed did have a copy of SRAM, the uh, uh, senior edificer. Andrew didn't find that fourth mana to be able to cast Commit. All of those things kind of happened in sequence, causing Ed's very, you know, touch-and-go early game to turn into what seemed like a, a blowout kind of game. But there were these little moments that caused it to go from, uh, from close to not close. I am impressed, though. Uh, you know, think about the draw that Ed beat there, mm -hmm. and quite handily, right? I mean, that was Ronus, as well as... Uh, Hard of Cure in one of the most brutal yeah. two-drops that's been printed in some time. So. Which, which attacked on turn three. Yeah. You know, I, that's, that's pretty good. And then there was also a Steel Leaf Champion in there, too. I mean, Andrew had an attack. You know, he can attack for up to 14 there, plus activations of Ronus if he had any way to crew the yep. the guy. I mean, that is that is some serious pressure. And Ed was just like, eh. Yeah, Andrew went attacky for four, attacky for nine. I no longer have any way to win yes. in that sequence. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's not exactly how I would have drawn it up. Yep. Ed's deck actually, one of the, the, the sneaky advantages is that it actually mulligans pretty well. Um, we saw that, that that game one, he had many, many resources in his hand that he didn't even have to utilize or didn't have <coughs> any chance to deploy because he killed too quickly. All he really needs to do is get that creature, and then a lot of the auras replace themselves. So once he kind of gets his game going, um, you know, he doesn't necessarily need to have the full seven resources to be effective. All right, we're underway here. <coughs> Adventurous Impulse, a card that Andrew talked to us a little bit about uh, when we did the interview with him yesterday said it can really help the deck along. A little bit of a toolbox aspect he gets, you know, right. a little bit of that tutoring. Also allows him to, um, you know, to only play 23 lands as opposed to, again, a lot of the other decks, 24, 25, 26 lands in this format. Playing only 23 means he's, he's less likely to flood out in the, uh, in the late game. Ventress Impulse helping to smooth those draws. Land go from Ed. And let's see if uh, if Andrew has something to... Yeah, this is decent. He's got a Servant of the Conduit. That can turbo out some stuff next turn, though. Ed's probably going to breathe a sigh of relief that it's not another Heart of Kieran. <laughs> let's see if he has SRAM this time, though, because that is one of the things that you'll note about a deck like this as well, mm. is everything looked fantastic because he had the perfect card on turn two. But as we see here with Knight of Grace, you don't always have it. And... Yeah, suiting up a Knight of Grace can be effective, but it's not going to look the same way that it did with Sram because he's just not going to have six cards in his hand at all times. Right, two mana two twos versus a green Stompy deck is not historically the way that you want to go. So, um, right. wow. And there's Ooh. one of the key cards we talked about. Ooh. I mean, that's, that's a kind of exactly what Andrew wanted for his turn three play. So now Andrew can threaten to just kill the Knight of Grace out from under a potential aura. Exactly. So Ed can't just um, put put an aura onto his Knight of Grace unless he has something like Dive Down to be able to save it from uh, from Walking Ballista. Well, he's got Baffling End, so he's just going to be a little more proactive. Interesting. So, so does he have a Dive Down here? He's just going for Baffling End right now. Okay. And one one counter from the Walking Ballista has been pointed at the Knight so far. And now a second. So maybe a missed opportunity for Ed to attack for two damage there. I think with the 2-2 two, two first striker, Andrew would have been... Um, he may have just used Walking Ballista, but but uh, Ed could have probably snuck two damage in. Not that two damage is likely to be the, the decider in this, uh, in this match, but... Yeah, the small edges do, like... Every once in a while, you get down to near the end of the game, and right. you go, you know, this game would be a lot different. And and Ed there having to, after mulliganing, basically get cleanly two for one <laughs> by, by, by losing. I wasn't ready for that yet. It's yeah. a little early yeah. <laughs> to run into a two for one like that. And look at this, a replacement ballista plus an attack from Beckstrom, and all of a sudden things are looking quite good for him. 
the role assignment for Andrew is pretty interesting here. I think he would much rather be the control player, which is not a role that his deck is particularly well set up to be. But here, two of the three walking blisters he's drawn. Wow. And here's another situation where Ed feels compelled to just use a baffling end to get rid of a ballista, but Beckstrom can't really be too bummed about that. He got a couple of damage out of it. And the follow-up is the Knight of Grace, but again, the big difference between game one and game two from Ed's perspective is, okay, so he gets two for one, one for one, but he doesn't have SRAM. He, he's down to two cards left in his hand, and if he goes for an aura here, okay, mm -hmm. you know, you have a pretty big Knight of Grace, but Andrew Beckstrom's deck does have the ability to just sort of cleanly go over the top of a 3-3. Of a three -three. And Andrew has some absolute haymakers here. So things like Verderous Gear Hulk, things oh like God. Vivian Reed could just absolutely um, decimate Ed here. So it doesn't seem like Andrew has access to those, given that uh, he's kind of thinking. Yeah, he has another uh, commit in his hand as well. Well, there you go. A Steel Leaf Champion's a fine addition to the board. Whoa. Oh, he tapped it for mana. Okay. Oh, well, that actually did leave him with uh, enough so that the Rampager still got to stay on the bat battlefield. So that works out well for Andrew Beckstrom. He ends up adding eight power to his side of the board and says, go. Nice 2-2. Two -two. Although, again, from Ed's perspective, not, not the worst case scenario. Right. And, and Ed sees, looks over and sees, okay, Andrew's only got one card left in his hand. Ed doesn't know that card happens to be, again, one of the very few pieces of interaction that... that uh, that Andrew has access to, and that's commit. So um, Ed, Ed with some uh, some potentially false hope here that he can build that battle cruiser on the Knight of Grace, Andrew uh, just needs to find um, a threat now to go with this commit. Yeah, he's down to just a Rampager after that Thopter arrest took the, uh, the Steel Leaf champion away in chains. He does have a good attack here, though, rep you know, leaving up the commit and just going ahead and attack with the Rampager if you'd like. Oh, wow. Oh, he's even going to just show his hand here with the thrashing Brontodon pre-combat and make it so that Ed really can't do anything uh, reasonable with blocks other than chump. So he's just going to take the damage down to 13, and Beckstrom's going to pass a turn back. He's down to a pair of three fours, but those are going to do pretty good work here. And we talked about... You know, with thrashing Bronson on, was it going to be good in these post sideboard games? Was it even the kind of thing that Andrew wanted to do? And being able to kill a, a cartouche of, of solidarity, not that impressive. But importantly, there's that Thopter arrest sitting ah. out there that's that's locking down Steel Leaf Champion. So Andrew has the ability to to get that Steel Leaf Champion back anytime he wants. Um, you know, so he could do something like block and sacrifice the Bronson on, or even bring the Steel Leaf Champion in instant speed. Yeah, I was actually wondering if Andrew was going to use the Thrashing Brontodon on end step just to upgrade, but he's decided that he can get some utility out of the Brontodon first and still have that option later. Mm -hmm. And and you know Ed has some some blocks he could make here, but uh, none of them are too attractive. And and one of the problems with with Ed entering combat in in non SRAM games is uh, how resource light he is. So again, we mentioned he mulliganed. Um, obviously got, had to get take a, a two-for-one very early on, and, and now is really far behind on cards. And another, you know, another flaw of these kind of rogue strategies, we see the draw for the turn being novice knight. You know, when, you, when, you're, when you're in this part of the game and you're playing constructed magic and you're drawing, you know, two, three vanilla creatures at this point, um, you know, you need to have higher impact draws to get yourself back into a game like this. Novice Knight. And here's that ambush that play that we mentioned before. Yeah, that did not work out well for Ed. Yeah, it looks like Andrew just said, well, I don't really know what you have, but I call. Yeah. And that did not work out well for Ed Wimpenny. He ends up just tossing the Knight of Grace into the clutches of that uh, Steel Leaf champion. And a bit of a misstep, perhaps, as uh, Andrew Beckstrom now turns his guys sideways. And yeah, Novice Knight can block the uh, the Rampager and soak up three damage, but it's just a chump block. The Adanto Vanguard can as well. He can either block and just let it die, or he can pay four life to keep it around. But either way, things are not looking good for Ed. The good news for him, though, is that he is up a game currently. So this is going to be a game three that Beckstrom's forcing rather than Ed having lost this round. Well, he can still joke about it. Look at him. They're both like... 
probably talking about what crazy decks they decided to bring. <laughs> yeah, and, and Andrew, the, we saw, we mentioned right between game one and two, that Walking Ballista, one of the very strongest tools that he can have in this matchup, he had two of his three copies of Walking Ballista on turns three and four, um, and that both caused Ed to fall further behind in resources and prevented him from ever kind of building, um, you know, one of those gigantic uh, uh, monsters that he needs in order to give Andrew any kind of a headache. So Andrew actually had a backup commit should anything happen that game. Um, certainly much more the, the way he wants the game to go. And you mentioned, of course, there's just a huge delta between games with turn two SRAM and games without. Yeah. With turn two SRAM, it seems fairly brilliant. You see, it seems like every card that you're playing is so powerful. Adding, adding draw a card seems to, tends to do that. Um, you know, when you're, when you're just kind of um, scraping by with uh, baffling ends, it's a, it's a different, different look entirely. It would certainly be difficult to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the decks in the format. It's important that, that Andrew, however, really just can't deal with a turn two SRAM. If there's, there's nothing like Shock or a Braid or, or anything of that nature. He doesn't have, um, you know, any way to deal with it until basically getting a Walking Ballista on two. So, uh, so he needs four mana either way. Yeah, I, I would imagine that, that Ed, you know, obviously he, he already mulliganed in, in game two and, and you have to keep most of your playable six card hands, but I would imagine he's going to be very aggressive in, in trying to find SRAM um, in his opening hand for, for game three. Yeah, because when you actually map it out, right, his two ways to deal with it both cost four. He mm -hmm. can commit to memory or he can, uh, he can play a Ballista. But the window for the Ballista to actually kill SRAM is actually quite short. Correct. So that's not good. And remember, Ed's going to be on the play this game as well. So the window is actually non-existent in most, like if Ed has turn two SRAM, it's going to take, you know, Man accelerators from Beckstrom to even be uh, have a chance at it, and that just puts a lot of pressure on commit. Yeah, and, and, and Andrew is so light on interaction in general. It's part of the you know it's the systemic uh, issue for green decks that we keep talking about. Yeah. That Ed, you know, we're we're we're, we're harping a little bit on SRAM. And there are a lot of non-SRAM games that Ed can win just given how how um, how poor Andrew's deck is at interacting with his opponent's creatures. So Andrew, mm. you know. Andrew wants to be the hammer. You know, he, <laughs> wants to, he wants to just play gigantic threats and, and put his opponent under pressure. Here's a 5-4, buddy. What are you going to do about that? You know, and, and, and Ed is, uh, is completely, again, um, coming from a different angle in the format. And he's, he, wants to, he can put Andrew on the back foot. So not a place where Green Blue Stompy is comfortable. W which side of the table would you rather be on here? Ed, for sure, yeah. I think that, that the, the way the matchup is, um, when you're playing white blue auras, you're just saying, "Hmm, let me count the ways that you can kill my creatures in your deck." And okay, zero, zero is a good way, <laughs> good amount of removal spells for me to play against. So this is a dream matchup for 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 white blue auras, and and certainly to be on the play in game three, I, I like Ed's chances. Ed has been running it up here. He's eight and one in the tournament right now, and as you mentioned a minute ago. You know, we, we are going to be kind of starting to eyeball the top eight here in just a couple of rounds. If Ed can pick up a win here and then maybe another one after, I mean, he's going to be in prime position to make a top. I mean, not even, like, possible. He'll be in good shape. And we could see this deck get in. And, and remember, his friend, apparently, they were 7-1 and one and 8-0 and oh or something overnight. Wow. Combined. Impressive. With this blue-white Auras deck. If there's one card that Andrew wants to see in his hand, it's Walking Ballista. If there's another card he wants to see in his hand, it's Lanor Elves. <laughs> and I'm going to guess he had zero of either. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Ed snapped that one. Ed looks like he likes his hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting some good vibe from Ed here that uh, he likes what's going on here. Well, it, must, it must be nice, though, to be in Ed's seat for this matchup, right? Because mm. normally you have to say... All right, well, I've got a bunch of auras, but one creature. What if they kill the creature? No, no worries. He's like, <laughs> this is clean. <laughs> I've got a creature. Like, he probably ideally wants one creature and a bunch of auras against Andrew. Absolutely. None of that, none of that dirty Frasca's Contempt or oh, no. Cut to Ribbons oh, no. or Unlicensed Disintegration. Or, and no, no one that's trying to 
prevent all combat damage no. with Rude Snare or, or put your card back in your deck with the Fairy. Andrew came to play good, clean, and honest magic. Yeah. I'm going to put out some giant creatures, and, and uh, not, he's not trying to mess around with what Ed's doing. You know, he's, uh, he's friendly. Novice Knight into Cartouche of Solidarity, man. Beautiful. <laughs> what do you want from me? Beautiful. I suppose that Novice Knight probably does do good work against Red, huh? Sure. And, Two, and again, three blocker for one mana. Yeah, and you mentioned it. I mean, that's Novice Knight into Cartouche of, of, of Knowledge, Cartouche of Sol Solidarity. That's, that's pretty... Um, Pretty good sizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if Ed has the SRAM. He had the tap land on turn one. There he is. There he is, but Andrew does have a land or elf, so he, he can accelerate here. And, and uh, Isn't it just too late? <laughs> I mean, seriously, <laughs> right? like, yeah. Ed, you know, Ed, next turn, you have to figure he's going to play some plus one, plus one aura on sure. SRAM, and it, boom, he's just out of range for the Ballista even next turn. Perfect start for Beckstrom under normal circumstances. And this does mean that Ed kind of needs to get the ball rolling and also will probably need to find something to give him lifelink at some point. But here we go, draw two cards. Does he have a one-drop aura as well? Oh, no. And it's <laughs> the curiosity... Curious Obsession as well. Yep. And that means that he will once again have gone aura draw card on a cantripping aura, then aura draw a card, and then hit you and draw another card. He drew four cards this turn, Paul. That's just a joke. Yeah, it already looks like Andrew kind of has a one-turn window to find exactly commit, or he's going to just fall too far behind. Yeah, blue mana commit. <laughs> that, that's where we're at here. Yep. So let's see an ether hub for the sweat, Andrew. No, there's no sweat. He would have thrown it on, on the table already. Andrew's not, uh, there's no thought process there, right? Yeah. There's nothing that could possibly be better than doing that. No, so. you're right. And especially because you might think, well, maybe he wants to wait to see if he casts another aura targeting mm -hmm. SRAM. But it doesn't work that way because SRAM triggers on cast. So it would just be letting Ed have another card. Another card and potentially access to things like dive down, negate, or spell pierce. Oh, don't say that. Yeah. That just, <laughs> yeah. Again, it's too early for that stuff, Paul. I'm not ready for it. So we're back to game one, where 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 Andrew. Oh, oh it's three mana. It's going to be another. Oh. Oh. This yeah. is a productive turn, mana efficiency wise. Yep. But can he, if he can't interact with SRAM, is he just going to lose? He's uh, he's in the same situation as game one, where he really just wants to see Ed not gain life. You yes. know, he wants to not have one of those life gain um, auras. So, you know. He put out a lot of power. He's threatening to kill Ed basically in two more turns. So he needs two more turns. And he needs Ed to not gain a lot of life and or, um, you know, find enough blockers to be able to survive himself. So Ed needs to obviously find a way to get one more power here for SRAM this turn, which he should be trivially easy to do. And the, re there. And the reason for that is he doesn't want Aethersphere Harvester to be able to just block for free. Mm-hmm. I am curious to see if he does not have. Oh, he's got a lot of lands in that hand. Yeah, it doesn't look like a great hand. So, you know, Andrew Beckstrom fans, don't don't despair. He still seems to have a chance here. Is that an adorned pouncer? A little late for the adorned pouncer to be. To be great. <laughs> it it is. That's cool. He stacks up a bunch of stuff, gives it flying, and just kills you. Yeah, but that's that's four lands in hand and three pretty bad-looking creatures. I, I, he, yeah, he has, what, a Dorn Pouncer, a Danto Vanguard? What's the other one? Uh, I think it's the Knight. <laughs> really? So not, not, <laughs> not too hot. We are not doing it. And this does not have lifelink. Now, he is still attacking with some pretty serious pressure. And remember, if Beckstrom declines to chump block with the Harvester, there's another card going into hand. And... He did get it. It was a Knight of Grace. And it's another draft card. And we yes, say, yes, <laughs> it is. Adorn Pouncer has arrived. Yeah, and I think a nice play from Andrew to not block there. Um, even though Ed is able to gain, you know, a card draw from the SRAM, Andrew's probably figuring Ed has all the resources he needs anyway. So uh -huh. sticking my Aether Sphere Harvester in there just to block is not the... Um, the right path. And it, even if I were going to want to block, let me wait until he even augments it even more and get a more valuable chump block. Well, Ed has left up one Glacial Fortress. But his hand is, is I mean, 
if Andrew took a look at Ed's hand, he Andrew wouldn't even dare to hope that Ed's hand is as bad as it is right now. Right. You know, that for it to only be lands and, and unplayable creatures. <laughs> uh, you're the best, Paul. <laughs> Contextually just unplayable. Sneak, Contextually. <laughs> So if Andrew has something to press the advantage here, then then he's gonna he's gonna put Ed under under an, a major pressure to have a yes. high quality draw step. Yeah, I mean, just as the board sits, he has attacks for eleven damage with Ed at fifteen, and again, no lifelink in sight. Now, Beckstrom, of course, has to respect the possibility that Adorned Pouncer could be a flying, much bigger Adorned Pouncer next turn. And he's going to do so by leaving the harvester and the and the elf back to uh, crew it. Still eight damage. That's half, over half your life total, Ed. So I, I really do feel like Ed, if he finds, you know, lifelink enchantment of various sorts, he'll be fine. Although that's really interesting too. Thrashing Brontodon can actually interrupt that. Mm -hmm. And and. Steel Leaf Champion's uh, claws of not being e easy to block looks pretty pretty tough here, right? The the, the Adorn Pouncer and, and all the creatures in, in Ed's hand, not effective chump blockers for the Steel Leaf Champion. So that, that's five damage right there of Ed's seven that that's representing. Ooh, Ether Tunnel was the draw step there for Ed. Is there a way he can chain together just enough to get that Adorn Pouncer lethal? Because he gets to draw a card off of this tunnel. That has him getting in for four. He'll have two mana left over plus a land drop to give as well. Still tough though, right? That land or elves plus plus thrashing Bronton on threatening to put a uh, to, to interrupt interrupt those plans. Right, absolutely. Plus the Bronton on can crew the harvester before that happens. Yeah, it doesn't feel like Ed's gonna be able to realistically piece together or win this turn. The, what I'm really curious to see is if he has to finally pump the brakes here and stop attacking. Well, Curious Obsession doesn't, doesn't like when you stop attacking. That's, no. That's for sure. Well, you just have to sacrifice the obsession itself, though, right. right? So Ed could still conceivably have a pretty big SRAM to at least tussle with the uh, champion. But. I think one of the things that we're seeing in this game is, is why these green players keep coming back to the tournaments with their land or elves land or elves look so strong this game accelerating oh andrew into the turn two steel leap champion and, and not letting ed have the time that he wants to set set things up the, the weakness of land or elves contextually again in, in standard is that it just dies incidentally to goblin chain whirler but here it's just been so strong look at this paul ed is now cycling a land rather than playing multiple creatures Simply because they don't do anything against that Steel Leaf champion down on the ground anyway. Okay, that's pretty good. Though I wonder if he wanted that on SRAM, actually. The good news about, about this play here is, is that even if Andrew were to use his... I'm sorry, no, I'm... I'm, I'm my, what I was about to say was that he, he now has two blockers for Steel Leaf champion, but that's not true. Andrew could still shrink the Adorn Pouncer down to two power. Right. So... And right now, what is SRAM sitting at? Let's see, two, two, three, four, five. Yep, yeah, but but it that's looks a, like it's going to shrink. With the champion, yeah. Where if maybe if you put the cartouche on the uh, SRAM, you kind of guarantee getting the champion off the board. Though this is starting to really get awkward here for Ed. And again, due due to the, I mean, his hand stinks. Yes, he he drew another adorned pouncer in there somewhere as well. So he's got two Knight of Grace and a Dorn Pouncer and some lands? Yeah, and he does not attack. So now the Curious Obsession is going to fall off. And as you mentioned, Andrew also has the ability to mess with any one of these auras thanks to the Thrashy Bee over there. And we're in a real position here where Ed, who had turned to SRAM, who has cast five auras this game, and just kind of bricked. He just found a bunch of air. Yeah, and, and it feels like he's maybe a, a, a turn behind again because despite being on the play, Andrew was able to disrupt that paradigm with the turn one Lanor Elves and, and, and accelerate his entire game. I mean, look how much power he has out with two force and an ether hub. Right. <laughs> you know? It's, uh, 
That's a lot of beef. No kidding. The sizing on SRAM is a little bit concerning right now as well. That uh, it's a 4-4 at least on its face, but can't really comfortably step in front of Greenbelt Rampager or Ethersphere Harvester because the Bronzedon threatens to shrink it in real time. However, you know, Andrew can't feel too comfortable about that. He, he, he doesn't want a, a situation where he passes back and, and has no way to prevent the uh, Adorn Pouncer from hitting him. So, interesting spot. Yeah, the Ether Tunnel giving the Adorn Pouncer unblockable if he can't kill Ed here does make that a scary proposition. Though, I got to say, if I'm in Beckstrom's seat, the fact that Ed decided to cycle a land in the middle of that turn does lead me to think that, you know, he's not going to just combo off, but yeah, you could. You could go aura, draw a card. <laughs> oh, another aura, draw another card, and kind of do that whole thing. Right. Seven cards in hand for Ed, or maybe it's six, but my goodness. As we mentioned, a Andrew in his wildest dreams, if, if you were at home concocting a hand <laughs> for Ed, he would never dream that Ed's no. hand could be this bad, no. you know? No, he wouldn't. But he has to be suspicious, right? After oh, cycling a land, he has to be like, what is in your hand, man? So Andrew's going to do this trick where he plays the Greenbelt Rampager. It's going to generate an energy, and while it's in the battlefield, though, it's going to just jump into the Aether Sphere Harvester before returning to his hand. And Andrew is now kind of carefully deciding what combat looks like for him at this point. Boy, it looks optimistic. Look at this. This is an attack for 14 if he sends everything in. A little bit complicated here because he does have two different creatures, Ed, that Andrew would like to shrink down. He can only do to one, though. And, of course, Andrew has to be careful that he doesn't leave himself in a situation where he could die next turn under, you know, a reasonable circumstance. So it certainly seems like the, the intuitive block is to put your, your token in front of the Greenbelt Rampager and your SRAM in front of the Aethersphere Harvester. Um, I think that a lot of the ways in which you win this game involve a Dorn Pouncer at this point, so I would be tempted to try to keep him out of combat, um, if at all possible. If, so if you block the Aethersphere Harvester with SRAM, you're kind of forcing Andrew to use the Thrashing Brontodon. Is that the idea? I'm not forcing him, but, you, but, but right now the SRAM would bounce off the Aethersphere Harvester, which Ed is certainly happy to untap with both SRAM and, e and, and the uh -huh. Pouncer. Um, if Andrew wanted to finish off the SRAM, which he would like to do, he would have to then use his Brontodon, okay. which then, you know, again, um, risks getting a, a major Aether Tunnel fueled kill the next turn. So. Right. So not forcing, but encouraging the use of that Brontodon. The, the good news for Andrew is that he's going to be able to gain three, li three life off of the Aether Sphere Harvester. He did gain an energy from that Green Pelt Rampager that came into play. Yeah. So he's going to go to 14 this turn. It's pretty difficult for, for Ed to grow the Pouncer's uh, power to seven. I mean, that's it's even though Ed has all access to a lot of different auras in his deck, not a lot of them give power for well, mana. With this block, he can't. I mean... He, if he loses SRAM here, yeah, th that basically shuts off that line of play. I mean, he has a few cantrip auras, but he's not going to be able to, you know, chain together four of them. I'm pretty sure this block removes all of Ed's outs, yeah. So, so yeah. Now, now, now Andrew's able to remove SRAM from the board without sacrificing his thrash, Thrashing Brontodon. So oh, now, now Andrew goodness. feels as if he has it locked up. He's completely comfortable. Yeah, I think we're going to see the body language for Beckstrom indicate some level of relief. Oh, sure. Point. Yeah, he's, he's playing quicker. He, yeah. he, he now knows with, you know, with, with just the one Adorn Pouncer out there, there's not that much can go wrong this turn. Yeah, I mean, you could see why Ed wanted to try to trade off SRAM there. But I don't think that given his hand, that led him to reasonable victories. It's, you know, because like, what, what's the best case scenario for him? Maybe he draws Cartouche of Knowledge into, say, another aura, but that's not enough still. Right. And a bunch of Knight of Graces is <laughs> certainly not going to get the job done. Yeah. But wait, there's more. He's got another adorned pouncer here, too. Now, these Knight of Graces cannot be targeted by anything that's black. That's so. right. 
They're all, they also get plus one, plus oh. As soon as a black permanent enters right. the battlefield. Once that happens, yeah. we'll be sitting here waiting for it. Now, the only way that can happen is if we somehow see a Dorn Pouncer <laughs> come back to the battlefield after dying. That's so. right. That's right. It is indeed. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's going to do it. We saw that green, green belt rampager finish things off, and we saw the, uh, the Oasis give it the necessary power to get the job done. So, wow, in a matchup that we were thinking was pretty rough for Beckstrom, he navigates his way through and picks up the win. He's still X and 1 here at the GP. Yeah, and, and we gave Andrew a little bit of trouble for his deck choice in this particular tournament, but the truth is that he's still playing with a lot of really good magic cards, including Llanowar Elves, um, a lot of creatures that, that have a, a huge size for their, for their converted mana cost. And so, um, you know, when you put good cards in your deck, if you draw them in the right order, you can put your opponent under a lot of pressure. And Ed did not draw the right combination of cards to really be able to give, um, you know, meaningful counterplay in game three. Yeah, it turns out turn two Steel Leaf Champion still quite good, uh, even if uh, he did need Ed to draw not super well off of that initial SRAM. You know, yes. he ended up with a handful of lands and, and two mana spells that you wouldn't normally want to play. Curve fillers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. All right, well, that's going to do it for our live coverage here in round number 10. But we've got Time Walk Magic coming up for you right after these messages.